morning, church family. Who is ready to praise and worship God with all of us today? I know I am. We are free in Jesus. Amen.
are children of God. And you know what? He chooses us every single day. And I don't know about you, but I just want to shout from the rooftops when I think of God's love for me. Because we are saved and we are healed with the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's shout from those rooftops today. about you, but one day I'm going to be so excited that we are going to have a big, big house. Amen? Because we are going to have many, many rooms, and we are just going to be able to just be with each other and be with Jesus, and that's going to be an amazing day. Amen? Oh, yeah. 
join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you on this Father's Day. Just very grateful that you first are our Father, Lord. And I just thank you that you knew that we needed you all those years ago, and you sent your only son to die for us. That's the greatest sacrifice any father could make, Lord. And I just thank you for all the fathers that are fathers that don't even have to be, Lord. And I just it's good to see you guys out there again today. good to be here in this big big house in God's house amen amen I'd like to start out by asking and you know based upon the people that I see the majority probably knows this song and I'm not going to sing of course <laughs> Cody <laughs> but I want to see if you know what this next word is or this word that I'm going to leave out and I asked Christine I said uh, you all need to learn this uh, song here and uh, I think they could do it but anyway it says good morning Mr. Sunshine you brighten up my day come sit beside me in your way I see you every morning outside the restaurants. The music plays so nonchalant. Lonely days, lonely nights. Where would I be without my Savior? Jesus. Y'all cheating. <laughs> well, the song goes, and I thought you all would know that. Where would I be without my woman? So I said, that's the only word you have to change in the song. Change that word from woman to either Jesus or Savior. And we're good to go. <laughs> Shows our age. Well, of course, today is Father's Day. And uh, I don't know how many of you have Facebook, but uh, I guess most of you probably have seen the gift that I received yesterday from uh, Shayla, she she bought me something I've been wanting for a long time. I'm just too tight to go buy it, <laughs> so, and so she did it for me. Bought me a hibachi grill, 
and uh, and so we tried it out last night for the first time, and and uh, it worked pretty good. I thought, didn't you get the invitation? <laughs> it's in the mail. Snail mail. <laughs> well, that was that was really nice. Uh, that's uh, a nice gift. I've asked her for one more. I won't say what it is. And um, maybe someday we can tell you. <laughs> well, you know, we're talking about Father's Day and we're talking about big, big houses and whatever. I remember the first home that uh, we ever not lived in, but actually purchased. I'm going to guess I was in the neighborhood of nine, eight, nine, ten years old. But the home was actually a home that someone had just, I guess, left. They moved, and nobody was living in the home. And so Dad bought the house. So we had to move the house. And I can remember uh, helping Dad carry it as he was tearing down the the rafters and the two befores and and then loading it in a truck, taking it up to the piece of property that that mom and dad bought and uh, putting it back together again. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that really sticks out in my mind is that, uh, you know, being that young, you know, what a kid will do, he'll always get in trouble. And I stepped on a board that had a nail in it. And of course that nail went into my foot and I screamed and squalled and cried and shouted and shout a bloody murder I'm sure but, but I won't forget that that was that was a long time ago that was the first uh, we had lived in in two to three different places I had some pictures I wanted to show you but they're in mom's things and they're stored away and I I didn't want to go through to look for them but but uh, I, I won't ever forget that that was that was a special occasion and a special time and what I want everybody to understand today that, is that we are never alone in our suffering because we have the greatest, most awesomest, if that is such a word, dad in the universe. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. And he says, when we suffer, he suffers. And we can understand that to an extent. Have you ever felt alone? Truly alone? Well, our message today comes from Genesis chapter 21. And we'll stay in that probably 95% of the time after someone answers the phone. Is <laughs> that <laughs> Father Abraham calling? It might be. You know, one of the things that has and I'm sure you guys as well uh, maybe know someone uh, with this COVID-19 that's going on. But they are so strict in this that people that are in the hospital, you're not allowed to go see. People that are in the nursing home, you're not allowed to go see. And there's been so many people that has passed away in the nursing home, in the hospital, just because of COVID-19 and not being able or not being allowed because of the, the restrictions to go and visit. And this uh, happened this, I think it's this past week. And probably most of you don't remember, but Dan Rogers was at one time, after, he's retired now, but he was over all the pastors I'm not sure if he's in the United States, but maybe it's worldwide. And he came and visited us one year when we were over in the theater. An awesome person. Him and his wife are just super great people. Two years ago, we went to on vacation out in Vegas. Well, now Vegas might be a not such a place you might want to visit, but um, we have a church there in Vegas. And we went to church that Sunday and visited our sister church in Vegas, and lo and behold, Dan 
and his wife, that's where they go to church. And so it was pretty neat meeting them. Well, this past week, and I've not heard any updates, Debbie, unless you've heard something. Uh, but uh, I think it happened Sunday or Monday or something. But anyway, she was riding her bicycle out in Vegas, and someone ran over her. And she is in serious, serious condition. Uh, I think both legs are broken, uh, ribs broken, uh, liver, spleen, you name it. She's got some really, really serious issues. And they were not for sure if she was actually going to make it through the first night. Uh, but we've not heard anything, and I guess in this case, no news is good news. The 16th was the last time we heard from them. But here's something that's even more hard to understand. Her husband, Dan, has not seen her since the day that the accident happened. He is not allowed to go into the hospital. And that's, that, that will be hard. That will be hard. And especially if something worse happens that she doesn't make it and then here he's had to stay outside and not go visit. Someone told me that the most difficult thing that they ever did was to take a family member to the hospital, to the nursing home, to wherever, and then like I said, not be able to spend time with him. And many have died. Many have died. Loneliness hits all of us from time to time. I know I don't think anybody's exempt. You know, sometimes that loneliness in, is inflicted on us by others. Sometimes the loneliness just feels it's just based upon a lie. Now, there's a story in Genesis about loneliness that tells an amazing truth about God that all of us benefit from. And it's the story of Ishmael, Hagar. And, of course, Sarah and Abraham. As you might recall, when Abraham was told that he would be the father of many nations. Now, you think about this. God has told Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham and Sarah don't have any kids. But he's going to be the father of many nations. That the lineage will come from his loins. But here, God tells them that they're going to have a child. And he even tells them what to name the child. Here's, the, here's one, of the, to me, one of the grandest things is that I think he was 86 years old. <laughs> and Sarah was uh, a few years younger. But, so you can imagine what was going through Abraham and Sarah's mind. Yeah, we're going to have a child at this age. Mm-hmm. So, being the humans that we are, we try to think, now, what do I need to do to make this happen? How do I need to help out God? So they come up with a plan. Sarah says, honey, take our handmaiden, our slave, if you want to call it, and that's not a good appropriate word I guess to use today, and lie with her, have a child with her. And so that's exactly what happened. And, and exactly what happened when she bore a son. And as the process was going along through this pregnancy, Sarah and Hagar just, uh, you can imagine, probably wasn't seeing eye to eye on things. Didn't get along as well because now she's carrying her husband's child. And so she's still childless. But here's the thing about it. God didn't need their help, did he? <laughs> when we stick our nose into God's business, try to help him out, it's usually a, going to happen to be a mistake, isn't it? We're going to, we're going to 
this mess up somewhere. Because, and here's one of, the, one of the good things I like about this, is God told them that they were going to have a child. He didn't say when, but he said they were going to. So they thought, well, I guess immediately. It was 14 years later before Abraham and Sarah had their child. 14 years later, I'm sure our minds and thoughts would have been, he forgot all about it, you know, what's going on, I guess we're not going to. But 14 years later, so that means that Ishmael's 14 years old. And so that brings us to the first scriptures that I want to read. If they work, Eddie, and if not, you'll make them work, I know, you're that good. Oh, a fuzz in my pocket. Yeah. Hey, it's been a while. <laughs> Smack it. All right. Can we stomp on it now? There we go. Got a little help. Thanks, Eddie. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah, Sarah saw the, that the face, or that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never Share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Hmm. That relationship really got serious fast, didn't it? Jealousy set in fast. Because God had told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. And so, of course, Sarah's thinking, you know, that Hagar's son is the one that's going to be uh, the father of all these nations. And so it just, it was, times got t so tough that, this is what happened. When we take things into our own, own hands and we try to do things our way, we're not helping God. We're, we're not doing God a favor. And then we end up, we get, get upset with the results. I mean, we know I talked about the, the rift between Sarah and Hagar. And where Sarah became so jealous that she told, told Abraham to get rid of her. We don't, we don't really know what kind of relationship that Sarah had with Hagar's son, Ishmael. But we do know that, is that after Sarah had her own son, she saw Ishmael as a threat and wanted him out of the picture. So she hired a hitman. No. And Abraham was so upset. Why would Abraham be upset? It's his son. That's right. And that actually, that's his firstborn. And it's, it's really getting stressful. Let's see if this works. Yeah, they, oh. did I go past it? Yeah. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it, because it is through Isaac, whom God told 14 years earlier that they were going to have, and what to name him, that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So even when we make mistakes, God turns it into good, doesn't he? Every time. So we see here what a mistake that was made, but God turned it into something that was good. You know, sometimes we have to send our kids off and trust God to guide and protect them. She wasn't even paying attention. Our faith in God's promises for their lives. And here God repeats the promise about Ishmael. He will be a great nation. He said that again. Told Abraham not to worry. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be cool. Have faith. God keeps his promises. 
you know, God repeats that promise over several times that Ishmael will be a great nation through him. And we know this to be true. The Arabic people are descendants of Ishmael. The Muslims also call Abraham their father. And we are connected through that same father, Abraham. I don't know if anybody remembers this song. I don't remember it, but Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise God. Amen. Aha! Uh -huh. well, I should have had you up here doing that. Or you can still do that if you like. <laughs> you don't see anymore? <laughs> well, imagine if we all did that. One day we will. In Genesis 21, 14. So early the next morning, Abraham did the hardest thing he probably had to do. He took some food, a skin of water, and gave them to Hagar and set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy, his son. You can imagine how hard that would have been. And she went on her way, wandered in the desert of Beersheba, and when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away. How far is that, Eddie? 50 yards away. For she thought, I cannot watch my son die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. Can you imagine how Hagar had felt, you know, had Abraham's son who was promised these promises and God told her he'd take care of her. But here she is. Her life was about to end and her son's life was about to end. That would be an extremely hard thing to comprehend, to picture that, to, to see that. You know, she was an outcast from what she knew as home. And she was rejected by the father of her son. She believed that she had been sent to die. She believed the lie that she was alone. And she failed. She failed to remember the promise that God had given her about her and her son. And she didn't see a way out. She did not see a way out of this point that she was in because she was in the desert and no water. And they were basically just dying slowly. So she left Ishmael under a bush. Now, think about that. He's 14 years old. So he's either going to wilt and couldn't go any further. Or she told, told him to stay out of the sun while she went to get water. Either way, she went just far enough so he could not see or hear her, and she sat down to die. Now, God has made some promises, hasn't he? He's made promises to all of us. But then we kind of forget, don't we? When things get down, times are tough. Maybe we feel lonely. We think maybe God forgot about us. But God was not done. He was not done with her or with Ishmael. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation, as he had said before. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Can you picture that? I could, of that miracle that God was doing right there in front of them. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up, and he lived in the desert 
and became an archer. And while he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him. I don't know about that, but <laughs> I guess that was the way the times were back then. <laughs> you know, we, we hear about God heard the boy's voice. And you can probably picture that as a son of Abraham. That, that wouldn't be something not surprising because of who his dad was. You know, God provided a way out. He provided them water. He just, I guess, magically, miraculously, or he led her to that well so she'd have something to drink to for this experience that she was going through. And when she got to the end of her rope and help was just around the corner and God was showing her and telling her, and teaching her, you're not alone. I'm with you all the time, every day. And so we're not alone, never alone. So what was the purpose, maybe, of this story? Well, the choices made by Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar not only affected all those involved, plus their children, they also affected many generations to follow. So the decisions we make, the things that we do, is going to affect your life from now on. You know, just like I said, I'll never forget that nail went through my foot. Whatever the things are. The choices made by Abraham and Sarah and Hagar not only affected all those involved, but it affected their children and their families and generations to follow. God didn't reject Abraham and Sarah for doing things their way. <laughs> Thank, praise the Lord for that. <laughs> because if, if he didn't, we'd be in a big mess. <laughs> so in spite of what they did God still blessed both sides not just one but both sides and so as a result you know we're interconnected with far more people than we've ever imagined and one day church family one day They'll all be reconciled in Christ. God's promises will come to pass. You can take that to the bank. Even if they don't make sense to us or they seem impossible. As I said earlier, Abraham was 86 years old when he fathered Ishmael. <laughs> I'm pretty sure whatever God decides to do, but I don't think I'll make it to 86. <laughs> you never know. That's right. God's in charge. <coughs> oh, by the way, I, I got to say this. I went to a funeral <coughs> Friday evening, and uh, Jubilee was taking care of the services, and their pastor was giving the message. And I, I'm glad I, I didn't do it, but it was such a, an automatic reaction. And in his message, he paused and said, God is good. And that, I, yeah, I almost did. And I, I realized, you don't do that. <laughs> but that was, um, that was a sad story. And I'll tell you about that more in a minute. You know, though rejected and disinherited, Ishmael still became a great nation as God had promised. He had promised that to Abraham. And so, you know, these are important observations, but I think the biggest lesson to this story is that we are never alone. Never alone. Now, you might wonder how I got that or how I got this. In one sense, no human is ever, ever alone. God has made us for a purpose, each one of us. Each one of us has made us for a purpose, had us in mind, as my scripture on the wall over says, before the foundations of the world, God had 
you in mind, you in mind, you in mind, me in mind, all those. But that does not mean that we're going to go through life and breeze through life, does it? We'll have our ups and downs. That doesn't mean that we can throw women and children into the desert or abandon them in some other way. And, but, and then we expect God to do a miracle, to help them out. God was not promised, God has not promised that no one will ever die of dehydration or malnutrition. Even believers can die in the desert. My first cousin, he and I were close growing up. And uh, matter of fact, I think evidently must got married the same year, but that was his wife's funeral that I went to Friday evening. And his wife was just an outstanding Christian. She did whatever she could. She wanted, she wanted to make a difference in people's lives. That, that was just one of her goals. She wanted to make a difference in people's lives and let him know who was living inside her. And she worked very hard at that. But she died at a very young age what I consider young. A couple of years, two or three years younger than me. You know, God had used her and was at the point that he knew that it was time for her to come home. And he took her home. I never was at their new home that they bought a few years ago, but I can imagine that the one she's in now is a big, big house. Amen. But church family, just remember, God will not leave us alone. He's made promises to us, exceedingly great and precious promises. The New Testament says, and he will complete the work he has begun in us. Now, do we believe that? We, oh, yeah, he said that 2,000 years ago when he was talking or when, the, or when this was written. You know, God's going to keep his promises. He'll not abandon us. Even though we walk into the valley of death, he promises to bring us out on the other side and live in this big, big house. He'll be with us, each one of us, every step, even if he doesn't intervene. No, he's already intervened for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what counts in the end. We will die, but we will also live through Christ. You're never, never truly alone because God is always with you. He's always with us in the person of Jesus Christ and dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. God's promise is true. You can take that to bank, so to speak. And this is what God says. Never. No, it doesn't say I, six months from now. But the word never. How long is never? That's the way I understand it. That's what I was taught when I went to school. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? No, suffering is a part of human existence. We all go through it. Uh, the older I get, the more I know that. <laughs> but we do throughout lives make choices. Good choices, bad choices. But God's promises are not dependent upon our choices, are they? And thank God for that. He is with us when we choose well. He is with us when we choose not so well. He does not turn his back on us. His back on us. 
or does he reject us when we do things our way? There's a song about that somewhere. God shows up in our suffering and he bears it with us, even if the suffering is not taken away. I remember probably a couple of weeks ago, Mindy had made a post that God had healed her. She just didn't know how. Two weeks later, she was gone, completely healed. Doesn't have to worry about anything. Healed. But on the other side of the fence, so to speak, in talking about loneliness, her husband of 40 years is now in a house by himself. And I talked to him Friday night, and he talked about how tough it was going to be. I told him that I was there any time. You know, Jesus suffered while God did not directly intervene when he was hanging on the cross. You know, the divine presence was with Jesus throughout the crucifixion. And the Father experienced the suffering right along with Jesus. Jesus was never alone. Even while taking the sins of the world, your sin, my sins, upon his shoulders, he was not alone. God the Father was with him. God would not, could not reject him or turn him away. God is with us. I got one more scripture that I'd like to read. Because it just went with a song about a big, big house. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that? I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He's going there. Now, is he lying to you? Absolutely not. He says it right there. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me. That you also may be where I am. And you know the way to this place where I'm going. Jesus, the way to the Father. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, comes to the Father, except through me. Amen. I got a, a little short video that I'd close on. And what I want you to pay attention to, I, I think everybody has seen this movie or at least knew about it, but I want you to pay closely attention to the last thing that happens in this video.
Where does God say he'll be? Right here. I thought that just fit so well. God will be right here, right in your heart, always. You can take that to the bank. You can count on that. You know why? Because God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come today on what we as humans, I guess, uh, created this as a Father's Day to honor all the fathers. And what a more greater dad than to have you as our Father, Lord. And you've made his promises. And Lord, we know that you're going to keep them. We know that we may get lost sometimes or think things are not going to happen, but you, you have promised us. And we know that it's going to happen, Lord. And we appreciate all that you're doing and all that you've done here at Grace Fellowship. And Lord, as we are looking around our world right now, Lord, boy, what does it ever need you? When we're battling this pandemic and the hatred that we see between people because of racism. It is so sad, Lord, to see all this. Lord, I pray that these folks, those that are battling this disease, get healed. And I pray that these folks that are fighting one another, they turn that into love, Lord. That solves the whole problem. That solves the whole issue is love because your word tells us that you are love. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, for taking care of us, having our backs, even when we make mistakes. We praise your name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church family, it was good to see you guys again this week. Looking forward to seeing you next week. And all those of you that are out there watching on our YouTube, we'll see you next week. Have a good week.